start of the day. Um, and remember, that was your current bibliography, uh, candidates from that, which are what you're looking at seriously now as um, what will be in your literature search. We talked about three to five sources there. Uh, your idea for a project and where it might go and how it relates to a thesis themes. Um, your beginning list of what you want your precedent candidates to be. So all of this, like most of the work in here, is, is uh, preliminary, tentative, exploratory, first shots. Um, so hopefully you've, you've made a start on those things. Um, and while I'm on the topic, let me say a couple of things about most of the things I'm going to be asking for, um, besides them being drafts and uh, you know your current thinking. The main reason I'm asking for things is to get you started thinking about it. And I know that in some cases, um, I'm asking for things before you're really prepared to commit in a serious way. But that's OK. I want you to commit in a non-serious way so that you in the thinking process. Um, the other reason is that those think pieces uh, can become bases for conversations with your chair. So as you begin to, um, through the process of producing these pieces, solidify your thinking, uh, not super solid, but at least more solid, uh, I think you're ready to talk to your chair. So don't feel like you've got to have your act totally together before you approach your chair and have a conversation. One of the jobs of the chair is to help you form your thesis, not just to help you manage it once you've formed it. So um, I'm encouraging all of you to um, seek early conversations with your chairs and, um, and use some of these think pieces that you're, that you're producing in here as a basis for a conversation. So um, and we'll talk in more depth, um, perhaps today, perhaps in a couple of days, about the committee itself. But these pieces are really not for me. They're for you and your chair. And I'm just precipitating things. I'm going to give you some reactions to things, but they're not as important as your chair's reactions to things. So um, that's another indication that this course is not the thesis it's one step removed or two steps removed from the thesis. It's trying to help you get it done and giving you some tips and tools and techniques for, uh, for doing that. Um, the other thing I want to mention is probably a little later in the week, um, we're going to begin to draw lots for the order of presentations that I want to begin to move into, probably on Mondays. Remember, I, I spoke early on about uh, pattern of you guys um, owning one of the days and probably two at a time presenting where you are uh, how it's going what your snags are having the class participate in reacting to where you are giving you some ideas uh, including me and um, and just having them be work sessions not uh, slip presentations but progress reports and so uh, it's not something you need to prepare specially for or at least make a big deal preparing especially for. Um, it's mo mostly showing up on those days that you're up and, uh, and just talking about where you are. And if, and if uh, you want to have some props, like a handout, or if you want to show slides, whatever you want to do, you're going to be in charge of your, your 20 minutes or so. Uh, so begin to get your, your head um, kind of already in that way, because uh, that's coming up fairly soon. I'm sensing you guys are beginning to get uh, at least some preliminary traction on, on what we want to do. And I think we're, we're um, moving toward being ready to have some of those conversations in here. So with the pieces that you hopefully took a shot at that I'll uh, collect today, I want to begin like we did before. Uh, each time you have something due, uh, hopefully it generates thinking, it generates observations, it generates the exposure of snags or obstacles. Uh, I'm curious how that went and what you ran into and what ideas came up when you uh, worked on those pieces that, uh, that you're going to give me today. So uh, speak to me. What's, what's some, uh, some feedback on this? A bibliography. Um, I find a lot of 
sources and books, but probably a lot more I find on articles and on the internet um, okay. and then online databases of journals and then some even some videos on TED Good. talks and things like that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure. Um, I didn't include any of those yet. You know, I put them in there and create a category for them. Because uh, there are several reasons for this piece of your thesis. You know, the first and obvious one is it's, it's your net being thrown over every resource you can get your hands on. When we talked earlier about the bigger the net, the bigger the pool of resources, the better. So the first and, and most important job of the bibliography is to arm yourself and surround yourself with supportive material. Uh, but it's also useful for those who come behind you. And so as you're finding useful things, um, bibliography should be totally inclusive. That's not something that you weed and call down. So uh, everything and anything you find, no matter what percentage of usefulness it may have, it should go in there. Because somebody who may be entertaining a thesis that's similar to your topic, um, will likely look at your bibliography, which I'm hoping you're doing also with the pieces in the library, uh, and glean some uses from your bibliography that maybe you're not getting. So, um, um, so if you're finding material that's in categories that are not traditionally bibliographic, uh, create a category under your resources and make sure you draw it. So then, what else did you run into? On the site, I mean, I think you mentioned you want an application, and mm -hmm. if you can, a location. So, right. um, myself, I kind of spent a few, a good few hours researching. Uh, Where am I going? Right. Okay. Um, we talked about unless site issues are uh, embedded in your theme, in which case the site needs to somehow be chosen and tailored to allow you to work with it. But if the site itself is not critical to the theme, it's just the place where the project's going to happen. Uh, a reminder that your site ought to be probably way bigger than it needs to be and uh, a fairly simple contextual challenge. So you don't wind up wrestling with site things instead of wrestling with the application of your themes to the project. Um, another little tip is if you can Pick a site in an area that you know or that you visited as opposed to something you've never been to where you've got to do it all long distance and, and with the web. You're also better off. Um, it's not unusual, for example, um, for a student to choose a site in their hometown or somewhere where they can get to and have a Christmas break. You know, they gather the information and tighten up their, their understanding of the site because they can get to it. Or they can get to records in their town with the city planning department or wherever you, you tend to find the material. Um, so the more real the site is, the better. Um, uh, especially if, if the site, um, first of all, it wants to have a, a decent relationship with the project itself. And, uh, and if it's if the site is thematic, like you're studying ecological issues or sustainability issues or anything sort of contextual response-wise, then there's a little more pressure to choose an appropriate site that gives you the right kind of challenges in the project. Um, so, um, in the same way that you're trying to be thoughtful about the application itself, and the building, uh, be be mindful about where you're, you're saying it's going to go. What else? Anything else that you ran into in working on this stuff? I think the nature of the tasks, the tasks are fairly, fairly straightforward, but oftentimes when you enter into the task, you know, mm -hmm. you, quite, that's when the questions bubble up. So, um, oftentimes you can't know what the question is until you begin that's why we start each class where something uh, is delivered. Let me see. 
So I'm not hearing any snags. I'm not hearing anybody having more than anything. I'm told that by the more you get in tears, you realize the more you need to are probably listening to what you think you know is not for what you want to do or what you think you want to do. Because by the more I do, the more I realize that what I started with last year is something. That's normal and natural. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It is a living process. You know, it's it's on paper the thesis may look like, okay, you should already have your act together, tell us what it is, don't change it, just go do a good job. But this thing stays fluid for quite a while. And uh, and you want that. Uh, that exploration where you're trying to get a foothold, you're trying to figure out what it is and what you're gonna do about it. That wrestling is is uh, demanding muscle types in your head that uh, that are some of the most important lessons you're going to leave the thesis experience with. And we're, going to, we're going to talk about that in detail at some point. Uh, it's going to sound very weird to say this now because you're preoccupied with the thesis as a product. You want to get it done. Um, but I'm going to try to convince you and talk later on that it's the process and the skill sets and strategy development and your ability to size things up and cut to the chase and be inside of the thinking. It's those lessons which are process oriented that are going to be the long term value of the thesis. Uh, probably not the content. Uh, the content and the subject for me is, is an occasion to develop those muscles. And that's why my mantra is almost always I almost don't care what you do, I care more how you do it. I want to watch and see how you're developing these muscles and how you're um, cultivating an ability to move through what begins as a very fluid, murky, confusing thing, uh, to get the fog to congeal into something that's tractable and to, to uh, get a foothold and then uh, take off and do what needs to be done. Um, so, I'm watching that as a teacher of the course more than I am how smart you're getting about the topic. Um, I'm interested in the uh, skill set, the muscles you're developing, it's, it's that kind of stuff. Because me, to me, that's what you're going to take with you. Uh, you may walk out the door and nobody, you, you won't find anybody who's interested in the topic, but they're going to be interested in what you can do uh, with situations. This is a situation. So uh, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. And the main thing I want to make sure of is you guys don't think that this scrambling and wrestling is somehow a negative thing. It may feel uncomfortable, uh, but it's it's exactly where you should be at the beginning of any uh, I've only heard of two people who don't go through that, Mozart and Michael Andrew. There aren't too many of those in that. <laughs> and there and there and certainly haven't been too many of them in recent years. So you shouldn't expect to be a Mozart or not. Huh? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I talked uh, last time about one of the main pressure points in the thesis was where you do your research and analysis and really push into your topics and take them apart and act on them. We did a little chalk talk on different thesis types, different diagrammatic sort of templates. Um, another pressure point is the project. So I wanna, I wanna spend a little more time today on the application um, because I'm beginning to ask for things about that and uh, your mind is on that. So let's push into that. Uh, and it's obviously and definitely not an arbitrary choice what you choose to do for your application. Some of these things I've briefly touched on before, but I want to review some things that we mentioned around the application just to make sure that we're uh, comprehensive here, at least as, as much as we can be. 
Uh, remember early on I said that the application need not be a traditional project, an architectural project. Uh, there have been theses that closed with a series of exercises, abstract sculptures, uh, a whole bunch of party looking models, which, um, which was the physicalization of the thesis uh, research. Uh, there have been theses that ended in the creation of useful objects like furniture uh, or other things that were not abstract, they were useful, but they were the mode of expression, the mode of bringing into the world and physicalizing, materializing the ideas that are uh, that are embedded in, in the research. Um, theses have ended in a series of alternative schemes in sort of conceptual form rather than worked out at uh, a fine level of detail. So closing with some conceptual alternatives that um, that are not uh, finally worked out is a legitimate way to, to uh, visualize an application. Um, you could do a study where you embarked on a scheme, you worked on it enough to show that you had responded to the research, but you didn't bring it to fine grain, slip fruition. Uh, and then we have a tradition project where, uh, like in recent years, you know, the, the scheme is fairly well worked out. You've got some pretty slick uh, packaging when you're done. Um, and, and that's kind of the way things have tended to end uh, in, in the last few years. It's really, really, really important that you talk with your chair about their vision of what the application should be. Because I can sit here and say all of those are philosophically appropriate ways to visualize an application. And your chair can have very strong feelings about the way the thesis should end. And so um, that's another really important reminder that you need to be working with your chair uh, in choosing your application and, and working on all these pieces that we're working on in here. Uh, so it's not going to be okay for you to go to the chair and you've thought about these application things and you think it's okay to end in studies and the chair says, no, it's not. And you say, well, no, wait a minute. White said that uh, you know, what White says comes behind what the chair says. So uh, it's the chair you've got to pay attention to. And that's why you need to make sure you, you let them shape the thesis. So we begin when we talk about application, about the range of things that have been possible in the past and the, the core of this is to manifest ideas. You've got these two things working together. You've got your research and analysis where you're really pushing into the intellectual scholarship, researchy, writing, thinking, reading thing. Uh, but because we're not an English department and we're not a philosophy department, you have to materialize it. You have to do something that brings it into physical form. So there's got to be a concretizing of the ideas, which means you're into some sort of expression, some sort of translation, some sort of transformation. And that scene between the non-physical and the physical is where the, the work's going to be you know, when you're wrestling with your application. Uh, another uh, thing we mentioned earlier that I'll remind us of is that the amount of investment you make in your application can vary. There's going to be a thesis effort. You know, there is a sort of an expectation of level of effort and work on the thesis. But the boundary and the percentage between research and design uh, is a sliding scale. We talked before about how your thesis may be mainly a high percentage of research and writing and thinking and scholarship and your materialization in the application might be a smaller percentage. That would argue for a series of studies or some rough alternatives uh, so that the materialization may not be a huge deal in the thesis. Or it may be the other way around. Your scholarship uh, is a smaller percentage. Yes, you've worked it out, you've investigated and written and, and, and uh, 
thought about it and, and uh, entered into your research and topics. Uh, but the lion's share of the work is in working out the physicalization of the issue. In that case, uh, that boundary slides the other way, and the research is the lesser component, and the application is the larger component. That's probably not a decision you can make up front. It's going to be something you find as you go. Um, and that's another reason why I want to work design and research together this semester, as opposed to in the past where we did all the research in the fall and we did all the design in the spring. That schism has caused problems in the past, and I'm going to try to solve that by making it a more homogenized, integrated thing where we're going to, we're going to actually begin to design a little bit this semester, uh, in addition to the research that we do. Um, in a couple of cases in talking with you guys, uh, it's also legitimate to begin your thesis thinking with what you want the application to be. There are a couple of you who said, I'm not starting with what I want to investigate. I'm starting with a physical problem that I see, and I'm going to tackle that site or this problem, and by looking at that architectural situation, I will find what my issues have to be. And that's another another legitimate way of beginning a thesis, is you start with um, some site or some project or some existing urban fabric or some building that needs something, and then you find what your issues are. Uh, so that kind of reverses the way that sometimes people may think the order should be. You can begin with a project in mind and back into your topics, or you can start with a topic and find an appropriate application. Either one of those is okay. But that, that reinforces the notion that the two need to work together. Um, you don't want to work too long on your scholarship topic before you begin to look at what a good application might be, what a good project. Um, I'm going to put a list on the board that talks about types of decisions that designers make, and it's not going to be a surprising list. You guys work with that in studio all the time. But uh, let me get the list up here, and then I want to make a point about it, because it has to do with the kind of project that you choose to uh, take on as a materialization of your uh, your thesis topics and investigation. So site organization and circulation, we're used to that. Building organization and circulation, so that's the interior, including horizontal and vertical organization. Space and scale, we're all used to that. Interior environment, things like acoustics, lighting, drumming comfort, uh, form, the whole sculptural, architectural expression of things, image and symbolism, uh, the kind of message that the building sends, what it looks like, the building envelope, Skin, the materials choices, the fenestration, all those kinds of things. Technical systems, things like HVAC, um, for example, and then construction. Now, the reason I've got this up here is because these are decision areas that you, you're going to enter into, or you, you're likely to enter into in the design of your application. And my point is this, if I have a thesis theme over here, or a thesis topic, or two or three topics, whatever it is you're saying you're going to investigate as a, as a topic area, um, 
this is going to tend to wind up influencing some of these decision zones more than others. For example, some of you are investigating uh, what right now feel like very technical issues, which are more likely to come online down here than come online up here. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with having a theme that is, when it comes time to design the application or the architecturalization, or the materialization of this, that this area of concern down here is where the emphasis is. But my caution is this, and I don't want the caution to cause you to jot down, don't choose a theme that doesn't influence the stand. My experience is that when some, when a student chooses a topic that concentrates down here, like detailing or something like that, and they're going to design a building, uh, they, there's nothing that the theme has to say about this which may make this arbitrary. Or maybe, maybe it causes the student to choose a given scheme that's already there. And so, uh, sometimes this, the point that I'm making now, can, can cause students to say, well, I may have a, a thesis theme that's going to concentrate down here, but I want to I wanna maneuver this so that at least I know it's going to have something to say about how I organize my site and the overall form, so that when I'm making this aspect of a scheme, when I'm making these kind of decisions, uh, my theme has something to say about it. So my point is that it's okay for the thesis theme to concentrate on any of these areas, uh, but keep in mind, at least out of the corner of your eye, your mind's eye, that if you're going to design a scheme that's on a site, you are still charged uh, with making these kinds of decisions. Now, the next thing, thing I'm going to say takes a little of the, the, um, the danger out of the point I'm making. And that is, if this is the scheme that's on a site, it has a configuration, it has a form, it has spaces and all that stuff. There are two things that are generating this. One is conventional design. For example, if we weren't even doing a thesis, there would still be logic you know about that has to do with laying out a good site, handling contours, handling edges, where to bring traffic in, uh, where to place uh, various project components like parking, building, landscaping, that kind of thing. So you're going to have conventional logic, just good ways of doing buildings and, and, uh, and projects. And then you're going to have a thesis theme. So the reason why I'm saying this lets you off the hook with this possible problem a little bit is you could design this with traditional logic and then say, OK, now I'm going to apply my theme. Um, now, Somebody else might counter-argue, well, isn't the project more interesting and valid if you found a way to saturate the whole thing with the thesis theme? Probably so. So that everything we point to about the project, you can say was somehow influenced or at least inspired by whatever the thesis theme was. So this raises the issue, the point I'm making now raises the issue of saturation. Um, I think it's fair to say if, if every one of these things can be said to be influenced by your piece of steam somehow, uh, then you've got more saturation and when you finally present the project, people will be more likely to appreciate the fact that it was generated by your piece of steam. And there are at least two levels that the thesis steam can um, operate at. One's direct and the other one's indirect. Direct is when the thesis theme has principles involved that say, here's a good configuration for being a responsive ecological 
design or years a good way to uh, plan fenestration to avoid uh, heat thinning and that kind of thing. So in, in some cases, you, you will have to still some principles here. Uh, and some lessons are going to be extracting from your literature search, your precedents, and your, your uh, thesis theme manipulation and, and uh, research and analysis. Um, some of those are going to be direct influences. They're going to they're going to say your roof should be like this, or your plan should be like that, or this kind of form works best, or whatever it happens to be. Some of these are going to be indirect. For example, you're going to be working with metaphor. You're going to be working with more of an artful, intuitive, poetic expression of your thesis, which is also okay. Um, operating at both those levels um, is actually desirable. Some of you are going to be working with thesis themes where most of your influence is going to be in the way, where it's poetic and it's artful, and the lessons never tell you exactly what to do. You're going to be internalizing it and using sort of indirect methods of getting at what the form expression of the thesis team wants to do. Um, it's nice if you can keep track of the influence, even of direct things, so that you can get your chair and your audience to appreciate how you got from here to there. But there are plenty of precedents in past theses. Um, that are what we call black box translations. And what that means is you immersed yourself sincerely in your topic, you internalized it, you, you metabolized it, you made it second nature, you gobbled it up, it's in there. And then without ever being able to explain how or why you designed something and you know it came from there, but when somebody says, well, now point to where it is, maybe you can backfill some words. But that isn't how the scheme got generated. The scheme got generated from the dark places in your consciousness where that stuff was sitting, and you don't really know what those mechanics were. You just know that when it came time to express your scheme in physical form, uh, by putting on the hat or putting yourself in this gear, that's what came out. That's another example of indirect, probably the most, uh, the most extreme example of indirect. Now, because we're in a university and we like to talk about stuff and we like to explain things, you can see that there's going to be a tendency for you to want to talk about the scheme as a response to this. Uh, but what I'm telling you now is sometimes that's backfill. <clears throat> Sometimes you design your scheme out of energies in you that are here, but you can't articulate them, you can't talk about them. The scheme comes out, and then you trot this list back out and you look at the scheme, and you begin to realize where it came from. That's what I mean by backfill. Uh, you're backing into your explanation. It's not a deal where you got your lessons all down and then you design directly out of that. So this is speaking to the ways you, you engage your research and your analysis and the ways you come out of that to produce whatever versions of the form is going to be. And I'm saying all that's okay. And I'm also saying that your chair is going to have druthers about this. Some of you may be working with chairs that are uh, more researchy, they want a more direct relationship between an ex and, and a, uh, an explainable visual relationship or visible relationship between the theme and the scheme. Others, may, others of you may be working with more artist types who are comfortable with the indirect. You know, they're just going to trust that you've sincerely immersed yourself in your theme and your research and your scholarship and that whatever you do is going to be a valid printout or expression or concretization of um, whatever that, uh, that scholarship was. Uh, we talked before about not getting too out of hand with scale. Um, at some point I'm going to ask you to um, put together a little brief program and site analysis. We're not going to make a huge, ask, uh, huge deal of the program. 
because this isn't a program in class. Uh, you're doing that separately. Uh, but you will have things like space lifts, the department lifts, square footages, probably a little bubble diagram, something simple like that. Uh, and you will be presenting information on your site and probably at least a little diagramming and some narrative about your site so that your, your, uh, your application doesn't just spring up out of the dark and people wonder, well, you know, where did this come from? So um, if you haven't begun that yet, if you're comfortable with what your project is, you can begin to make a little department list and space list of the kinds of things that will be in there. Um, and if you're comfortable with your site choice, you can begin to put some information together on that uh, as well. Um, so that's just a, a quick walk around uh, the application thing, the design thing. Um, does any of this generate questions for you guys in terms of what you're facing and what you're, uh, you're looking to need to do to begin to square up to your choice of project? All is clear enough to uh, begin to think about. Mm -hmm. All right. A um, couple of other things. Uh, I want to urge all of you, um, unless you already have one, to have a simple version of your thesis diagram. Um, it's not unusual for your first draft of the thesis process diagram uh, to have just tons of pieces because it's your first shot at this is to have all the things you thought about doing in the diagram. So what I'm going to challenge you to do now is to begin to see if you have multiple, multiple pieces to your diagram. Begin to see how they group up into categories and see if you can't simplify the number of components and the kinds of relationships that are happening between the components in your thesis diagram. Another way of coming at it is um, get clearer what the main chunks of the, what the main topics of the thesis are and how they're relating to one another. Um, so both of those paths toward a simple thesis diagram one is simplify the complicated diagram you have. The other one is step back and just think about what the main research topics are that you're, you're obligating yourself to look at. And let those represent the chunks or the bubbles or the squares and how they're, uh, how they're related. The thesis diagram uh, should include both the research component and the application. In other words, I'm going to do these things to the themes, and out of that's going to come this project. Um, so we can see what you're intending to do with, uh, with your research as it applies to your, uh, to your project. So, um, We'll talk probably Friday. I want to spend one session on just working with the committee. Um, and then I'm going to move into some other things having to do with a more detailed treatment of the process. Things like working plans, keeping files, keeping diaries, keeping uh, minutes of meetings, that kind of thing. And, and they really have to do with uh, the overall topic, I guess, of project management, you know, how we're going to navigate. Those things interest me because they have to do with those skills that we're going to take away uh, from the thesis experience. Let's see if there's anything else around uh, application and say until we walk away from that. All right. Oh, here are a couple of other things that apply to the board work today. The, the big question that the thesis is asking when you look at the research concerns and the project concerns, the application concerns, is what does a project look like 
when you've allowed it to be primarily influenced by these topics. Um, in a normal, if there's any such thing, in a normal architectural project, you have multiple claims on form, don't you? You've got solar response, you've got internal function, you've got contextual uh, response to surrounding architecture, you've got all kinds of things that say, respond to me, respond to me, you know, the form wants to be this way because of that. In the thesis, it's asking that same question in a slightly different way. It's saying, if I can find a way to dedicate this form primarily to this topic, what does architecture look like? That's really what's being asked when you're taking the research and you're applying it to form. Um, what, what form, what shapes, what sculptural configurations, what space configurations occur when we turn X, Y, Z loose on it and we try to get all the other factors out of the way uh, so that they're not so much making claims on the form, but rather your, your research topic is um, shaping the lion's share of what we see on the board. If we get in this form. So in a way, it's kind of an artificial exercise and experiment. We know that a real project truly has to respond to multiple things if it's going to be considered successful. But in the thesis, we're saying, to the extent we can, let's set those aside and turn this thing loose. What does the animal look like that comes out of this thing? Um, now, you'll never make it pure because you can't get past conventional logic. You, you can't let your thesis theme allow you to do dumb things on the site, for example. So the scheme's going to have to work, assuming you have a scheme. But beyond satisfying conventional logic in a basic way, then how purely can you, uh, can you apply the, uh, the influences of your, your, uh, your research and your thesis themes? Another way of asking that slightly differently is, in what ways does your theme influence architecture? One of the traditional kinds of reports that are given by a student at the end of his or her thesis is, Yes, I tried my best to get my research to generate the scheme, and I found that it primarily influenced this, but not that. I found it was particularly difficult to get it translated here. I found it really easy to get it translated here. In other words, what was that marriage like? Nobody's going to be as intimate observing this marriage as you're going to be. So what was that encounter like when your thesis themes and your scholarship came up against the making of form. Where were the solid touches? Where were the misses? Where were the near misses? Uh, commenting on that engagement is another way of thinking about um, the application. Uh, because you're probably going to find that in some cases, aspects of your thesis theme, you found no ways to materialize it. It stayed idea, and maybe it was indirectly applied. So commenting on direct and indirect, indirect application is another thing that, uh, that hopefully you can observe when you're through with all this at the end of the spring. Other question? Yeah. So that, wouldn't, so that wouldn't be a bad thing that some of the aspects of, I guess, your topic can't be realized in, I guess, a schematic form? Can it be just a kind of like a spatial thing? Because I know you said, you know, the application would be sculptural. Or, furniture or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. So, because, um, I don't know, sometimes I, when I was thinking about the application, it's kind of hard um, trying to like physically realize some of those things. Well, some of them could be possible and others, it's kind of, I don't know. Hard to see where the bridge is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you're, you're going to discover that most intimately when it comes time to do the application. And that's why I want to embark on it, at least in rough the semester. Um, so there, there are two pieces to answer your question. The first answer is you're trying with all your heart to get everything applied. You're trying with all your heart to get your thesis topic totally moved into physical expression. Yeah. 
but at the same time you're observing things left behind that you were not able to, things that you could get uh, incorporated but in sort of an artful, metaphoric way, and things that just slid right into place and were easily physicalized. That's part of this observing the process that I mentioned a minute ago. So uh, if, I had to, if I had to bet, I would say uh, none of you will get all of your thesis theme into the building or into the project. And so observing what parts of it get there, and not just that, but what parts of your application does it touch? You know, uh, these decision zones, for example, or whatever your version of the decision zones are, that's another kind of wisdom you're going to get from this that we, we want you to share with all this. You know, I entered into this process thinking that my topic was going to influence all of those, and I found out most of it was sight, or I found out most of it was form, or I found out most of it was by, um, materials or whatever it happens to be. You won't know that till you begin to tinker with the application. What other questions come up from uh, from what we addressed? Okay, what I want you to begin to think about, and I'm not going to ask for it yet. Um, I want you to begin to, to jot out um, at least listy, outlining treatments of the, uh, the literature pieces that you're going to analyze. So let's say you're flirting with five or six. Uh, begin to jot some notes, which will be your overview in your thesis what each of those literature pieces are. Um, so the first job is the whole bibliography. The second job is of the whole bibliography, what are your main sources that will rise to the level of literature review in your thesis. And now what I'm saying is if you're comfortable with five of your literature review candidates, begin to work on that. Uh, begin to jot down some some things that can be an overview of this book, an overview of that article, an overview of uh, that web page, whatever it happens to be. And the other piece of this is begin to tinker with information extracted from your precedents. If you found three to five decent examples of projects that seem to be generated by your thesis theme, then begin to assemble material on those buildings, begin to jot down reactions to them, begin to maybe even do some preliminary uh, a little analysis. You know, we're going we're gonna to flesh that out and tighten it up, but it all starts with tinkering. Um, writing is full of little useful aphorisms. One of them is, first you make a mess and then you clean it up. Another one is, there's no good writing, there's only good rewriting. So, we're not going to do anything heavy duty, serious, uh, everything's, ten everything's tentative, exploratory, but it'll gradually tighten up and become more serious as we move through the tunnel. So uh, just let these first notes be think pieces. First notes are for your eyes only, maybe the second and third version or things you, you give to me. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're, we're over today. Um, we'll get together uh, Friday and talk about managing the committee and some other things. If you've got pieces that, um, that um, from the list that I mentioned before, I'll take those now. Please make sure you've got your uh, names on those things and you give them to me. I don't know, I'll do it. See you all on Friday. Yeah, you get the time after.